Good morning and welcome to online worship for Spencer United Methodist Church. I pray that uh, you're having a, a great week, a great weekend, uh, and I thank you for joining us for a time of worship this morning. A uh, couple of quick things. Uh, first of all, uh, this is the big one. Uh, we have a special event, a uh, uh, series of events going on on Thursday nights in July uh, from 6.30 to about 8 o'clock. Uh, we had our first one this past Thursday night, uh, and we uh, had the opportunity to uh, have uh, the kids and the families um, enjoy some uh, 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 yoga uh, that was paired with a story that held the kids' attention. We had a nice time of, of, uh, of fellowship and community afterwards. Um, and I want to uh, say a couple of things about that. First of all, next week, uh, this Thursday uh, at 6.30 p.m. in our uh, IGA Fellowship Hall at 95 West Franklin Street, uh, we're going to experience live animals uh, provided by uh, Silly Safari, and, uh, based in Indianapolis. It's going to be a wonderful experience uh, to be shared uh, by kids and their families. And um, I, I want to make two things clear. Uh, this is open to everyone. Even if you attend uh, another church or no church at all, this event is for you and your family. It's particularly targeting kids uh, from uh, pre-K through fifth grade, but I, I, uh, it's, it's something that families will hopefully be able to enjoy together, an opportunity to connect with other families. Uh, and the other thing that I want to mention is that I want to encourage our, uh, our congregation uh, to be present at these events, because this is an opportunity for us to connect with the families in our community. Uh, and so even if you um, don't have children or grandchildren who might be interested in attending this, uh, I would encourage you to come so you can introduce yourself, uh, so that you can get to know people, uh, and so that we can make it uh, a time of community building. Uh, so I would encourage you, uh, what, what, whichever category you might fall into, I would strongly uh, uh, ask you to um, be present at this event um, and have a good time. It's going to be a blast. And uh, even after that, we'll have two more weeks of events. But this Thursday, come out and check out Silly Safari. Well, let's uh, pray together. God, we thank you for the joy that we can experience. We thank you that even in the midst of all our struggles and worries and fears and burdens, that you give us peace and you give us hope. And God, we pray that we would cling to that peace, cling to that hope, cling to that joy that you give us. And help us to remember that though there are many things in this world that claim they will give us joy, that they will give us peace, that they will give us satisfaction, help us to understand that ultimately, true joy, true satisfaction comes from you. We thank you for your generous spirit. We pray that we might open ourselves up to receive what you have to give us, but also to respond with our own spirit of generosity in our relationships with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sinner 
of your sin Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to
going to share a little personal fact about myself, and, and I'm not embarrassed about it. It's something I am willing to openly talk about it. I don't think it's anything to be embarrassed about, but uh, I see a therapist. I do. And uh, again, I'm not embarrassed about that because, frankly, I think everybody could use a good conversation with a therapist. I also am a huge advocate for uh, removing the stigma uh, attached to um, uh, mental illness and disability. So um, I, I'm not embarrassed about that. But putting that aside, um, my therapist recently made a statement that at first rubbed me the wrong way until I really thought about it and and got at what she was trying to say. Here's what she said. She said, everyone orders their lives in such a way that can help them find their bliss. And I think the reason my initial response was a negative one is how I interpreted the word bliss. How I interpreted the word bliss was it means whatever makes me happy, whatever makes me feel good. And the reason I had a problem with that is because I strongly believe that order orienting our lives around what makes us happy or what makes us feel good leads to a lot of problems for ourselves and for those in close proximity to us. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that's probably not what she meant by the word bliss. She's not talking about fleeting feelings and fleeting uh, happiness. That's not what she's talking about. When she talks about bliss, she's talking about a, a level of satisfaction with one's life. It's, a, it's that feeling that one is living the way he or she was meant to live. And I think the reason I was confused is because the, the concept that she referred to as bliss, I might refer to differently. I keep using the word satisfaction to describe it. In fact, it's in the title of this message this morning. But the Bible has yet another word for that state of, of satisfaction, that state of living as you feel you were meant to live. And this is the word, shalom. Now, if you've been in Christian circles for a long time, heck, if you've ever met a Jewish person, uh, you have probably at least heard this word. And more than likely, the meaning that you've been taught for this word is peace. But the fact of the matter is, the word shalom means a lot more than peace. Now, to be fair, it, it, does, it does get used that way. It can refer to an inner tranquility, an inner peace, or it can refer to relational peace, peace between uh, human beings. But it means a lot more than that. Shalom is bigger than what we English speakers would refer to as peace. It's bigger. It's, it's, there's a lot more substance to what that word means than just peace. It can mean prosperity, and I'm not talking about financial prosperity. I'm not an advocate of the prosperity gospel. The kind of prosperity I'm talking about is a holistic one, not just a financial or material one, but one of body and mind and spirit. It is, a, it is, an, it is an overall well-being. It is a functioning as you are intended to function. It is a flourishing like a garden that is beautifully tended and fed and watered. That is the essence of shalom. And I can point to examples in the Bible where it was used for other ideas besides peace. Specifically, shalom is often used to ask after someone's well-being. In the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, Jacob uses the word to inquire about the well-being of his uncle Laban. Joseph, Jacob's grandson, inquires about his father using this word for 
well-being. Shalom is also used to wish someone well when saying goodbye. For example, uh, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, when Moses goes back to Egypt to lead God's people out of slavery, Jethro uses the word shalom to wish Moses well upon his departure. When uh, going back to the book of Genesis, when Joseph um, is consulted by Pharaoh about some disturbing dreams that Pharaoh has, Joseph responds that God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires, or more accurately, the answer that will bring him shalom. So there are layers to the meaning of shalom, and it's a lot more than just peace. And when we come to familiar passages that use the word shalom, and we understand that it's more than just peace, it's more than just tranquility, it is a state of well-being, dare I say it, a state of holistic satisfaction, although I'm not entirely sure that's, that even covers all that shalom entails, but it certainly casts these familiar passages in a new light. Let's look, for example, at this blessing from, uh, that uh, was the traditional priestly blessing spoken over God's people in the Old Testament. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And of course, the word translated here into English as peace is the word shalom. But shalom, again, is so much more than peace. In this blessing, it is the, the receiving of God's blessing and attention and grace that is where holistic well-being, known as shalom, comes from. There's a psalm that uses the word shalom rather frequently, Psalm 72. And Psalm 72 is a prayer for the king of Israel. Now, exactly who the king in question is is actually a little bit ambiguous, um, a few possibilities is that it was written by King David in honor of his son Solomon, who succeeded him as king. It could have been written by Solomon in honor of his father David. Um, it could have been written for Solomon by a completely different psalmist in honor of his father David. Somehow it does tie into King Solomon and his father, King David, but we don't know exactly who the king is that this prayer is for. But let's take a look at some select verses from this psalm. For example, the third verse says, May the mountains bring prosperity, and the word translated as prosperity is shalom. To the people, the hills, the fruit of righteousness. A few verses later, verse 7. In his days, that is, in the days when the king rules, may the righteous flourish and prosperity, shalom, abound till the moon is no more. And then here, a little bit later, we get a rather lengthy passage that uh, describes what that state of prosperity, that state of shalom, is hoped to be under the king's reign. He will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live, may gold from Sheba be given to him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. May grain abound throughout the land, on the tops of the hills may it sway. 
May the crops flourish like Lebanon and thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. Then all nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Now, whoever wrote the psalm wanted God to work through the king to bring shalom, prosperity, and well-being to the people. And this is what they imagined it to look like. Mercy for the poor and the needy, rescue from oppression and violence, having one's needs met. And particularly notable, this king would do more than just provide that for his own people, but he would do so for all the peoples of the world. Now this prayer, historically speaking, was most certainly about a normal human king, but had I not given you any context, who would you have thought that psalm was about? Sure sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus is ultimately the source of shalom. The prophet Isaiah wrote this very familiar passage that we believe to have been fulfilled in Jesus. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of shalom of the greatness of his government and shalom there will be no end he will reign on david's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this and so even while we're still in the Old Testament, centuries before Jesus would officially come on the scene, a prophet is looking ahead toward the coming of a king who will bring about that shalom, that all-around well-being that God's people have been looking for for generations. Now, by the time we get to the New Testament, though, the New Testament was written in a different language than the Old. The New Testament was written in Greek. Eirene is the word translated as peace in the New Testament, and it most certainly means peace as we understand it, a state of tranquility. But keep in mind this fact of history. When Jews of Jesus' time, actually a bit before his time, translated the Old Testament into Greek, they used the word eirene in the place of the word shalom. So to a Jew, in the time that the New Testament was written, the word eirene, the Greek word eirene, carried all the same shades of meaning of the Hebrew word shalom. So when the angels announced Jesus and they said, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests, they were talking about Jesus as the prince of peace, the one who brings shalom. Jesus was clearly about bringing prosperity and well-being to all people and helping them flourish. When he preached in the synagogue in his hometown, his home church, if you will, he read this passage from Isaiah's writings. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he sat down, because in that time and place, the appropriate stance for a teacher was to be seated rather than stand. He had made this announcement. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus undoubtedly came to nurture human well-being and prosperity, shalom. 
He came to feed and nourish and strengthen human lives. He came to help humanity flourish because ultimately that's what God has wanted for us all the time. The problem is we've tried to do it without him. As it turns out, my therapist was correct. We do build our lives in a way that helps us reach our bliss, that helps us find some degree of satisfaction. Unfortunately, we try to build our entire lives on things that we think will get us there, but are nothing more than distractions, are nothing more than red herrings. All, this sort of satisfaction, this sort of, 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 of prosperity, this sort of well-being, shalom is only available through the prince of shalom. So the question I have for you is, what is guiding your search for satisfaction in life? Love? Family? Your job? Your hobby? Now don't get me wrong, all of these things are good things. All of these things are things that God can use to bring satisfaction in your life. But orienting your life around any one of these things will never bring you true satisfaction. Will never bring you true shalom. It is God who gives these things significance. It is God who guides how we ourselves uh, invest in these different areas of our lives. It's God who decides what is in proportion, what takes priority. It is God who gives significance and order to our lives. But perhaps another important question is this one, because we're not just responsible for seeking shalom for ourselves, but we're also called to Nurture it in others. That's what Jesus did, after all. What are you doing to ensure that others experience true shalom? Are you sensitive to the overall well-being of those closest to you? Not just their physical needs, but their emotional needs, their relational needs, their uh, spiritual needs. Do you seek to be part of the solution and not part of the problem? Are you more concerned about taking than you are about giving? Are you working to make life better for other human beings? Or are you part of the problem that makes life harder for others? Do you seek to shape our world so that all human beings can truly thrive? Or do you seek to shape it in such a way that only you can thrive? Let this be your invitation to be part of the solution in both your own life and in the lives of others. And of course, the solution the answer for finding satisfaction, the, the answer for how to orient your life in such a way that, that well-being, holistic, all-encompassing well-being can be part of your life. It is only attainable in the one the Creator sent to be our Prince of Shalom. There is only one who can guide our lives in such a way that such a satisfaction, such a, a prosperity and a flourishing is possible. And that is through Jesus Christ and letting him determine our priorities, letting him guide how we invest ourselves. Seek satisfaction nowhere else but in him. Let him give meaning and significance to the things you value in your life. And make sure 
that you are not so fiercely seeking satisfaction for yourself that you deprive others of it. Let's pray. God, you are the source of all good things. You are the source of everything that brings joy and meaning in our lives. But when we devote ourselves to the gift and not the giver, that is when we run into a problem. God, you are the source of all satisfaction, all meaning. You are the one who guides us in such a way to order our lives in a way that not only causes us to flourish and provides us with well-rounded well-being, but you also call us to live a life in such a way that we do the same for others, that the well-being of others is preserved as well. And so help us decide today that we are not going to orient our lives during around the things of this world, but around you, the one who blesses us with those things, who gives those things as gifts. But help us to love you, the giver, more than the gifts themselves. For only then can we tr- find true joy, true peace true well-being and help us not be so selfish as to hold on to it for ourselves may we help others to have that sense of well-being and flourishing in their own lives god we have needs we can't live in denial of that But we will always be bound to neglect either our needs or the needs of others when we don't put you first. You are the one who gives meaning and order in our lives. You are the gardener who causes us to flourish. Help us to devote ourselves to orienting our lives around you. Help us to be open to being nurtured and nourished by you, the gardener. Help us to be willing to be shaped as clay in the hands of a gifted potter. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to close worship with a hymn. It's a joyful little hymn that celebrates the satisfaction of being in relationship with Jesus, of knowing that he is walking beside you, just like he walked with Mary Magdalene when she saw him alive for the first time after he rose from the dead. It's that kind of joy that this song depicts. So let us sing in the garden together. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet. The birds hush their singing and the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he 
walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I'd stay in the garden with him Though the night around me be falling But he bids me go through the voice of woe His voice to me is calling and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known and now as you go about your week, may you seek the peace, the prosperity, the well-being that only God can provide. And may you also nourish it and nurture it in the lives of those around you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.